Okay, today's show is going to be on using the notice of liability. This is going to be a counteroffer kind of counterclaim against uh, PG&E or the power company for uh, getting rid of the smart grid and the smart meter specifically. This document was created by Cal Washington and uh, promoted by him and Josh Del Sol and it's an excellent um, way of dealing with the power hungry uh, people that believe that they have the absolute authority to impose themselves on you and violate your rights. So let's get into it today and we'll delve into all of the aspects of it. The problem arises because you don't have any rights. When you go to court, you want to get a jury trial to hear your complaint, and the fact is you never will if you're complaining about the government or its corporations in general. The government's going to be against you. The judge works for the government, so he's going to be against you. And you're, it's unlikely you'll ever see a jury. You know, the jury's never going to hear your complaint, never going to see the evidence, and you're never going to get a judgment. So this approach is non-judicial. It goes around the judicial process and bypasses it completely. If you watch the shows on Commercial Lean, you'll see uh, exactly what uh, is going on when you listen to Lance talk about it. And we'll get into that later. So the first place to start on your journey to getting a notice of liability together is to get some background research and watch Josh Del Sol's video, his excellent video, on Take Back Your Power 2017. And it's available to watch for free at Dr. McCullough's site. So it, you can go to see his must-see documentary reveals dangers of the smart meters and you can watch this for free. In it, about an hour and 20 minutes, you'll see all of the evils of the smart grid and why it's being implemented across the world in every country. They're trying to get this as like um, world domination where they can spy on you and know everything that you're doing and they'll probably be able to cut your power off without affecting any of your neighbors. They're going to know everything about you. The Stasi would have loved a system like this. I mean, you know. Anybody who's interested in police power, if you could uh, listen in on everybody's conversation in their home, what a joy. Anyway, if you watch this show, you're going to uh, see quite a bit of eye-opening, you know, interesting facts. However, you know, most people that are into it already have researched the smart meter. It's been around for quite a while now, so they probably know most of these things. But this is a complete very complete and well-documented expose on it. So you start here and watch the show. In fact, I would supply a copy of this video and use it as an exhibit, as evidence, and let them rebut and counter this information here because th they would have a hard time doing that. The next thing to do is to go on YouTube and type in Empower Movement and go to their um, website with this is Josh Del Sol in Cal Washington and um, you can watch the uh, Mass Action of Liability 2017 and in this show they're going to go through how, the, how to use the Notice of Liability and what results they have gotten from using it and the results they've gotten have been impressive so it's an inspirational to watch this because it's always nice to see um, people getting results as opposed to, you know, you got 200,000 people marching in the street and the government doesn't really care one iota. Whereas if you can get somebody to quit their job, that's a big deal. Anyway, the mass action of liability. And then after you've finished watching this, uh, you can go on to their website and um, empower movement.com and join up and after you join you'll be able to watch the second edition of this video series talking about how to implement the notice of liability so you're gonna have to get familiar with the terms and the 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 instrument itself and it's not worth doing unless you understand it the next show I think it would be well worth your while to watch is they must watch Commercial Lean's show here by Lance. And he does a really good job of explaining the process and the reasons for doing the Commercial Lean's. And 
the reason is that you just can't get any joy in a court, whereas you can get joy with a commercial lien. The notice of liability, in my opinion, is not truly a commercial lien. It's similar to the lien process, and you're going to claim that you have a right to do the lien based on a contract agreement, but at the same time, it's not strictly a commercial lien. But if you listen to Lance's explanation, he'll give you some extremely good pointers about doing it in such a way as to get good results. The idea with the commercial lien is that you send a notice in the beginning, which would be your administrative remedy, letting the other side know that, uh, you know, you're stepping on my foot and I'm demanding that you get off. So you're telling them what the tort claim is and that you want them to pay you for the tort claim. And after 21 days when they don't reply, that's their administrative remedy, then you go into the affidavit of obligation. Once again, you're doing an affidavit and point by point outlining the harms that are being caused to you that you're that are tort claims that you can get paid on and then do a ledgering of the amount that each claim is worth and add it all up to a sum specific. Then he gets a uh, solicitor, which is a like a paralegal over there in England, I guess, to um, be the record keeper and show that there was no um, response done and they issue a certificate of default that no response was in evidence. And then he goes to court and has the court recognize the process. And his claim is, you know, it do, the lien has no value unless it's in the public record. So unless you're putting it in court or at the county recorder or somewhere in the public record, the lien is worthless in the private. So here's Cal Washington uh, doing his mass action and explaining how you're going to get the contract satisfied by tacit agreement. You're going to watch the show on YouTube that he has and um, enjoy what he has to say about it. There are two parts to this series. Only the first one is available on YouTube. So if you go on the website inpowermovement.com, you can download the template, which is the Notice of Liability. And it's a fill-in template, so you can just uh, fill it in and then mail it off. And it has everything you need. You can add more people to the libel list and make changes if you want. But his, his position is, is that the template has to be used the way it is if you want his help in uh, making sure you get what you want out of the situation. Most people's processes are really only perfected if you do it exactly the way they have it written and um, you know if you're competent to modify them then you know you can do whatever you want but you're also responsible for doing whatever you want so in this case you're gonna find out the people that are acting as um, the power supply company the PUC the Public Utilities Commission the legislate legislators that helped enact this stuff and they're going to be the people that are going to be the recipients of your libel they're going to be the libelies so he calls here and after respondent libelies they're going to be the ones that are liable for the damages that they're causing you by the installation of the smart grid and the smart meter So he starts it off with a preamble, whereas it appears this and it appears that. And the only people that I know that do statements like this, whereas, are legislators. Most of the bills that you see are, you know, whereas, it, whereas the Bible is the word of God. So anyway, he starts off with a bunch of whereas statements. And then he moves down to um, describing the restrictions that this... Um, contract are going to place on you. So the restriction of jurisdiction. Other than as expressly represented herein, you agree that no section of the contract shall be assumed to constitute a voluntary election by any of the parties thereto to submit the contract or the said parties to any venue of law, jurisdiction, court, or tribunal, other than the by, 
the, by the agreement of the parties as stated here under. So you basically are telling the other party that they are not going to be able to take you to court on this and this will this uh, document will not be able to be reviewed by an agency or administrative administrative tribunal or any court subject to the federal or state uh, or political subdivision so you're keeping you're keeping the contract away from the purview of any um, other man right basically it's a deal between you and the people that you're sending it to and when they sent you an offer it was a deal between them and you they didn't say oh you can take this to court no they just sent you a notice in the mail and said this is what's gonna happen and so this is just a counter offer saying that okay I accept your offer based on this and if you don't like it you can remove your offer and if you don't do anything then you're going to be all bound up forever because I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen to you if you don't um, rebut this. So we have the definition of contract from Black's Law, just so you know what a contract should be. An agreement between two or more parties, preliminary step in making of which is offered by one and acceptance by the other in which meet, minds of the parties meet and concur in the understanding of terms. And second, it is an agreement creating obligation in which there must be competent parties, subject matter, legal consideration, mutuality of agreement, and mutuality of obligation. An agreement must not be so vague or uncertain that terms are not ascertainable. So when you have a meeting of the minds, two parties that get together and bargain for something, both they have to understand exactly what the bargain is for, right? Everything has to be spelled out so both parties are happy. If you think that you're buying something and the other person thinks they're selling something, but the thing that one person is selling and the other is buying are different things, then obviously you didn't have a meeting of the minds. And can you have two competent parties if one of the parties doesn't exist? That's the problem with all contracts. The state would have you believe our contracts, like a driver's license. A contract where there's two competent parties. How competent can the state of California be? I mean, they don't exist. They can't perform. They can't have an obligation that they can perform on. How are you going to have mutuality of obligation or agreement? How can, it be, how can there be an acceptance if the party that's doing the acceptance isn't real and doesn't exist? How is the party that doesn't exist going to have a meeting of the minds when it has no mind? So that's what a contract is supposed to be. And if you were in, you know, buying lumber at the lumber yard, that's what the contract would be. It's only in fiction world where the contract doesn't comport to that. So under Bouvier's Law Dictionary, under Maxims of Law, consent makes the law. A contract is a law between the parties which can acquire force only by consent. Now, it's not a law between you and anybody else. It's only a law between you and the other party who are engaging in the contract. The contract becomes enforceable between you two, not enforceable outside of, you, of the two parties making the agreement. And it has to, and it acquires force by consent. But there's a lot of definitions for consent. They use the definitions for consent against people when they say that you can actually consent by not saying anything. So here's the next definition tacit, done or made in silence, implied or indicated, but not actually expressed. So there's no written or verbal expression. Latches, a stopple by, a failure to do something which should be done or to claim or enforce a right at a proper time. So time is an element for, an, for latches. A neglect to do something which one should do or to seek or enforce a right at a proper time. A species of equitable estoppel or estoppel in, in, by matter in pies. So estoppel is a bar. You're, you're being stopped from proceeding at a later date because you waived your rights. It's the same thing as saying you're barred from making any complaint. You had your chance to complain, and after a certain period of time, you, you were barred from making that uh, objection. You let it go. 
So when you say you have 30 days to respond, if you don't respond, you had your chance, and now you don't have it anymore. Neil Dissett, he says nothing. This is the name of the judgment which must be taken of, as, of course, against a defendant who omits to plead or answer the plaintiff's declaration or complaint within the time limited. In some jurisdictions, it is otherwise known as judgment for want of a plea. So this is what happens in a court. If you put in a complaint in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, you have 21 days to answer. If you don't answer, the other party can get a default judgment. And a default judgment is the most powerful judgment because there's no dispute. It's not like the jury's going to decide one person's facts are better than the other and they might have got it wrong. No, nope. one party made the claim that you wronged me and the other party didn't object to it. They didn't put it in writing. They didn't say they they didn't show a reason why they had a right to wrong you. So they got they defaulted on being able to make the claim. Acquiescence. Acquiescence and latches are cognate but not equivalent terms. The former is a submission to or resting satisfied with an existing state of things, while latches implies a neglect to do that which the party ought to do for his own benefit or protection. Hence, latches may be evidence of acquiescence. Latches imports a merely passive assent, while acquiescence implies active assent. Like, you know, are you okay if I go dancing with your girlfriend? If you don't say anything, then that's an active assent. So, he who is silent is supposed to consent. The silence of a party implies his consent. If you don't say anything, you must be okay with it. He implied the consent. And then, he who is silent in, is considering as assenting when his interest is at stake. So when you grab your friend's car keys and you go, hey, I'm taking your car, and you're looking right at him, and, he's, and he doesn't say anything, if his interest is at stake, hey man, you can't take my car, I need it, or whatever. If he doesn't say anything, he must be okay with it. So there's an act of assent there. Then silence can only be equated with fraud, where there is a legal or moral duty to speak. Now morals are the you know, domain of religions. You know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. These are morals. If you don't, if you're if you don't have any religion and you don't believe in God, you may not have any morals. Silence can only be equated with fraud, where an inquiry left unanswered would be intentionally misleading. We cannot condone this shocking conduct by the IRS. Our revenue system is based upon the good faith of the taxpayers, and the taxpayers should be able to expect the same from government in its enforcement and collection activities. This sort of deception will not be tolerated, and if this, if this is the routine, it should be corrected immediately. You know, like asking them a question and them refusing to answer. See, they have a legal and moral duty to speak. If you say, I deny that I'm liable, and I don't see any uh, constitutional authority you have to place a liability on me, and this is why, you know, and they don't answer that, then they're just, you know, deceiving you by failing to state any cause that you have a liability. So here we are with the notice of liability again. Guarantees and waivers of benefits. Guarantees for this instant action are the 1611 King James Bible, the coronation oath of Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor, the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, constitutional oaths of office, the common law, the law merchant, the uniform commercial code, and case law. The claimant libelant does not claim any benefits of said guarantees. They're included because the public officials, through their oath of office, are limited by those guarantees. They are mandatory and prohibitory on the oath taker, the public official. And all corporate officers are bound by the same restrictions that the agents of government are bound by because all corporations are created as franchises by governments. They don't create themselves. It's a, they ask the government for permission to be a corporation, which grants them limited liability so the people involved can't be sued. All they're trying to do is duck out of being responsible by forming a corporation. That's all it is. 
And for that privilege, the government gives them a privilege, but they can't give them something that the government itself doesn't have. So here at this website, they show the importance of the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. That King James Version of 1611 is what the Queen of England takes an oath of office on. In the United States, from George Washington to Barack Obama, each president has taken an oath on the King James Bible from 1611. So now we have the notice. Response must be by the effective date. This is on the notice of liability, which is 14 days from the postmark date of this contract. I wouldn't use 14 days. It's too quick. You know, it's due unto others. You should have others due unto you. I don't like getting large pieces of documents that I'm going to have to pour through and respond to. And two weeks is not enough time for me. A month is reasonable. Response must be to the postal locations of the two witnesses. Now here, this is a thing of beauty because if you go to court, the court is the observer. They're just doing ministerial function. They're letting uh, know the docket shows when a document got put in and if there was a response or not to that document. When you're using two notaries, or uh, if you're using a notary, then the notary is going to be the honest person who's going to not be swayed by and not uh, an honorable person is not going to lie for you so they're gonna say I got a response or I didn't get a response but since you're not really trusted to not lie if you have two people that aren't related to you like you know not your cousins or brothers or something like that but two independent people yeah they're gonna be a witness and um, the definitive term is what the Bible declare declares so I like to use the New Testament, so if I can. So here you have Matthew 18:16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So that would be you and one more would be two witnesses. You and two more would be three witnesses. And, you know, two witnesses that's not you would be able to establish the fact. Like, they say it happened, then it's not likely that they're going to be lying. So in order to find out the parties who you're going to send your um, notice of liability to, you're going to use the Internet. It's pretty easy to do a search. And here's an example of searching for the members of the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission. You keep If you keep looking, you end up finding what you're looking for but you have to be pretty diligent about exhausting every little place that you can f try to find things mostly you try to look for the contact us or about us section but anyway you look it up on the internet and you keep searching until you find it the other advice I'm going to give you is that when they give you a telephone number oftentimes it's worthwhile calling them and ask the secretary or whoever answers if they have a fax number, an email uh, account that you can email, the name of the person who's the um, CEO or the president, and the address, because maybe the address that they have on the website is not the current address that they're using. And if you don't have the right address, you're going to be mailing out your documents and they're just going to come back. And if they come back, well, then they didn't get them. The other thing you're going to want to do is, you notice how I highlighted the address and the telephone numbers and everything. You're going to create a Word document and just paste these um, in, that information there so when you want to go look for it later, it's easy to find. And then you can, you know, just put all of the contact information and addresses and everything onto a Word document. Then you can keep that Word document with your, uh, make a folder up on your desktop that's a uh, notice of liability for the power company or whatever and put your uh, Word document in there. So you can see with a little more searching, I came to this page about the CPUC, and it's uh, got uh, Michael Picker, who happens to be the president, and it also lists the other four members. So you need to get their information, you know, the, the true name. So you can click on their bios and read who they are, and you're going to click it you know, you're going to send the NOL, and I would send it to like two, three, whatever members of the PUC because they're responsible. 
And if you keep searching, who appointed them? How did they get into power? And you find out that uh, Governor Jerry Brown appointed them. In addition to that, you're going to claim that um, they're acting as respondeat superiors. So it's a maxim of law. Uh, the respondeat superior is um, the person in charge, the person who's responsible. If an agent acts and does something according to the wishes or policy of his superior, then the superior is responsible for his actions. That's the concept. Of course, if you go down to the bottom, you're going to say the doctrine does not apply in relation between state officers and their support subordinates. Why not? Because the guy at the top wants to have no responsibility whatsoever. But of course, his agent is doing, you know, acts according to his policy, so he is responsible. So I put in there that you're the respondeat superior. Another good thing to do is search the internet for information on smart meters. So here we have a ruling denying Marin jurisdiction to ban smart meters. And is that uh, really the way it is? Well, no. If you look up Fred Kelly Grant on YouTube and his articles on coordination, if the local um, jurisdiction decides to enact an ordinance that smart meters are going to be banned, the state government and the federal government has to coordinate with them. And coordination means they have to obey them. They have to take their the locals rulings about what is going to be uh, okay or not okay for acts within the um, geographical area that they have legislative authority over and they have to abide by that look up Fred Kelly Grant coordination and you'll see that the state has no power to overrule a local uh, local uh, jurisdiction so here's a little quick search for PG&E Corporation officers. And you see that uh, Geisha Williams, and it's I always like to get their full name, so upon a search I found that her middle name was Jimenez. Okay, so you use her full name if you can. Uh, she's the president, and the rest of them are directors. So interesting, you just, you know, you're going to use at least two, three, you could put everybody in there if you want but you're gonna serve the, your process on these people because they're the ones in charge they're the directors they're the president they're the CEO they're the chief financial officer So then we go on uh, the Secretary of State's website and we look up Pacific Gas and Electric and we call it it's a, um, a the corporate name and we do a search for for their business because they if they're a corporation doing business in the state they have to have uh, they have to have the authority of the state say that they can do business and so they'll list them in there and when you click on the name you'll find that they have a registered agent for service of process this is the person who because the business is a fiction they need to have somebody that you can mail legal documents to so I generally tend to go okay I'm gonna send it to the person care of the corporation care of the registered agent for service of process and even though this is not technically service of process at least they wouldn't be able to argue that they never you never properly served them because you did and then when you look at all of their little filings here it's kind of interesting and here let's look at uh, PG&E which is a publicly supported monopoly because that's what it is a monopoly they gave PG&E the right to, to put their products on government uh, owned roads through easements and supply electricity for the benefit of the people and the PUC is there to control them and say what they could charge and what they couldn't charge but let's just look at the amount of money these guys are making it's unbelievable so this document shown here is filed by the state of California by PG&E with the state of California on May 24th, 2017 and it shows what they were paid last year these executive officers and directors. Um, Anthony Early was paid 11,730,000. That's not bad for a year, huh? He's got 137,000 shares of a publicly supported monopoly. PG&E is a monopoly. They had easements to put their product on the streets that were given to them, no doubt, for free. Um, 
how about all these other people? Jason Wells, over three million. Edward Halpin, almost three million. John Simon, almost three million. Hoon Park, almost three million. Dinar Mystery, at two million two hundred. Nick Stavropoulos, three million nine hundred, almost four million. And the president of the company, Geisha Williams, four million one hundred and sixty-four thousand. These people are getting w rich off of a publicly sponsored monopoly. It's wrong. And I'm a firm believer that you should know your history, know who you are, what your relationship to the government is. Veronica Chapman here on YouTube does a three-hour presentation. This is Great Deceptions, her title. And if you listen to it, she explains it quite well. It's almost identical to the way it is in the United States. She's in England. And, you know, there are a lot of places where you can get um, a lot of information on your status in relation to the government. But, you know, it's worthwhile to listen to her show and get an idea. If you're not aware of these issues, get an idea of how you fit in in relationship to your government. The Supreme Court ruled in Briscoe v. Lahui that it was okay for a policeman to lie on the witness stand and commit perjury, to say knowingly fraudulent things on the witness stand. And when he was sued, they said that you couldn't sue the policeman for lying on the witness stand. Wow. So if you testify and are found to be lying, like Martha Stewart did, you go to jail. But if a policeman ch lies on a witness stand under oath in a courtroom, he doesn't go to jail. And this person tried to sue them for, for damages. And the court in Briscoe versus LaHue said you can't sue him, even though he lied in your court case and it affected you. My statement is, therefore, that if you're going to sign an affidavit here, you better understand each thing that you're swearing is true. Because... The last thing you want is for them to come back on you and say that you lied. So if you're going to make this plain statement of facts and say many, utility com many utilities are installing or have installed so named smart or advanced digital utility meters and related technologies which A. can record and transmit data for the purpose of surveillance of personal activities in the private dwellings and or workplaces of all utility companies customers without disclosure or consent. Do you know that to be true? What evidence do you have that that's true? If you don't have any evidence that you can point to, I would not make a statement like that. I would only make statements that I have actually seen the evidence. You know, of course, um, personal first-hand knowledge is, you know, technically... You know, you were going to say, I saw some Bob, you know, this man over there hit this other man with a baseball bat. Well, if you witness that, then that's true. If you watched a video of somebody doing an interview, at least you watched the video. But if you've never seen the video and you're making statements about things that you know nothing about and you don't have any evidence that if somebody says, oh, you know, what are you basing that on? Well, I don't know. I got it off the Internet. I would be very wary of making statements under penalty of perjury for for things that you don't ha that you've never seen. That's just my two cents. I would try to stay out of trouble by making statements that you have never seen any evidence of. And that's why if you're going to be using a notice of liability against your power company, I would include Josh's "Take Back Your Power" 2017 video as evidence. You know, this is exhibit number one. I watched this, and because I watched this, I believe all these things are true. So with a little searching on the Internet, I came up with this. This is a news article. Am I going to believe this? Sure. It's not Alex Jones or some um, offbeat uh, news organization that doesn't have any credibility. It's Channel 5 News in Bentonville. And they're saying that um, smart meter evidence was used in a court case. Well, if they're using smart meter evidence, then that must mean that they acquired it through the search and seizure of your information in your home without a warrant. That's your evidence. So you can just use that URL and put a footnote in when you say that this is what, this is what gives you the reason to be able to say that. This is your supporting evidence. And then uh, here's an article by CNN that the smart grid may be vulnerable to hacking. Well, it is connected to the Internet. 
Anyway, the interesting part here is where I highlighted it. President Obama has championed the smart grid and his recent stimulus bill allocated $4.5 billion for the high-tech program. In 2008, they passed the TARP bailout bill, and it had a stimulus bill in there. And the, the problem with it is they allocated $4 billion to uh, install the smart grid. Now, if that's what they did, and this is the evidence that that's what they did, I'm going to call that a bribe. And the bribery works both ways. It goes, the person who offered the bribe is, in, is uh, uh, guilty of bribery, and the person who accepted the bribe, in this case PG&E, the power company, accepted the bribe. So they're both guilty of uh, violating bribery laws. And that's my evidence. So here's an article by CBS, the news channel in San Francisco Bay Area. Now, is that a trusted source? Of course. You're going to say that they're lying. They had an article, Overheated PG&E Smart Meters Overcharging Customers. There's your evidence. If one meter's overcharging customers, all of them have the potential of overcharging customers. And the analog meter never had a problem overcharging customers. I mean, the amount of analog meters that overcharged customers was probably infinitesimal. So I'm going to recommend that you look into the Notice of Liability and the In Power Movement. This is a very powerful way of getting around the fact that you just aren't going to get any joy in the court system today. And this goes around the court system and makes them answer questions which they never want to do under penalty of perjury in front of a notary. So guess what? They're not going to answer it, and when they don't answer it, your unopposed affidavit becomes the law. You, you're not going to be able to just immediately go collect any money out of it. And if your desire is to get a lot of money, it's probably not going to ever happen. You know, if you were going to do something like that, the only righteous way to do it would be to create a trust for the benefit of humanity and education of the people and have the money be paid into the trust for the education of people. Then way, that way you could say, there's, I have no financial interest in this. I'm not trying to get rich, and I don't care if you don't pay me, but you're going to pay for the harms that you're causing society. And, you know, this, I'm not an attorney. This is not legal advice. This is for your educational purposes only, to make you aware of something that exists that might have a way of helping you with your issues. And my belief is that the notice of liability could work for any issues where you're being, uh, where you're suffering a denial of your constitutional rights. So I hope you look into it, and God bless. I highly recommend you do Avery 5160 stickers. Uh, you can print them off on your uh, printer and uh, get them at Costco in uh, you know a large quantity, and it makes uh, mailing repeated envelopes very easy because you can just stick the stickers on and you don't have to write everything out each time. I also recommend you go on Google and type in the right to keep and bear liens by Hartford Van Dyke here and you'll come across this PDF and he makes a very interesting observation that he believes that all court judge orders are actually commercial liens and that when you don't object to them then they become enforceable because acquiescence is agreement anyway read the article and see what he has to say it's worthwhile robert fox usually recommended doing an allocution at sentencing and it's always interesting to me that sentencing didn't occur directly after a jury determination so they'll give you nearly a month when you can rebut the determination of guilt for those that are interested, I created this uh, forum, so if you want to talk to other people that are interested in doing this process, you might be able to learn something there. Just join it. It's a private forum for members only. Peace be with you.